on Wednesday night, I started something that I said I would continue today. And I know um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a somewhat I would say slightly controversial topic in in some ways, but um, we're going to look at it anyway. And I hope that when we come to the end of it, we can have some kind of um, agreement. And not only that we can agree, but that we can have a better appreciation of prayer. Some time ago. I did ask God to help me to understand prayer better. I don't know if there's anybody who has a perfect understanding, but like like many of us, I'm sure, I have been I've been I've been wanting to understand prayer better. You know, we we are told that we should pray, we are encouraged to pray, but we do have the experience that many times we we pray and we pray earnestly we pray consistently and it seems like we don't obtain the, the the requests we don't obtain the things that we ask for and um it is one of the things that i have asked the lord to help me to understand better prayer because i, I don't think any of us wants to be just doing something for the formalism for the ritualism that was old testament religion we want to know that whatever we do it makes sense, it is effective, and it is producing a result. So I wanted to talk about prayer because that question comes up all the time. People keep asking me, and sometimes, to be honest, I don't have the kind of answer that I would like to give. I don't have a definite, clear answer such as I would like to give. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my, my screen, share my Bible. And um, then we're going to look at some verses that I have here. All right, so. Okay, there we are. So first of all, I want to look at the, the question. I want to look at some places in the Bible where it talks about prayer. One of them is in Revelation 8. You might not think Revelation is a good place to start, but let's go to Revelation. In Revelation 8, you have, um, I think this is important because it's the book in the Bible that speaks about the end time. And it's the book in the Bible that gives you a, a view into things that are happening in heaven. It may be somewhat symbolic. It may be symbolic in some ways, but at the same time, it is the truth. And if you look at Revelation 8, verses 3 to 4, look at what it says. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense. Now we understand that the incense here represents the righteousness of Christ. And how do we come to that conclusion? We conclude this because God told the Hebrews that they should make this incense and he gave them specific directions how to make it. And it was to be a special kind of incense. And they were to make no other incense like this. And it was to be used for only one purpose. It was to be used in sprinkling in the altar, in the, in the sanctuary. And if anybody made any incense like it, he was to be put to death. So this special incense, when it came up, for, it was to rise before God as a sweet smell. And when God smelled this incense, it made it more possible for God to bless his people. So clearly the incense represents something special to God, something that enables God to bless his people and so we understand that the incense here represents the righteousness of christ and it says this angel is offering much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before god out of the angel's hands so here you have a picture whether we, we, we say it's a literal picture or not. Here we have a picture of prayers being offered in heaven. And these prayers are mingled with the righteousness of Christ. And they rise up before God. So in the book of Revelation, there's an emphasis on the fact that God's people are praying. And they are praying in the name of Jesus. That's what the incense represents. They are praying in the in the in the in the faith 
and in the confidence of Jesus. They are depending on Jesus, and this is coming up before God in heaven. There's another place where it's mentioned in Revelation 5 and verse 8. Here it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. It's interesting. They are represented in heaven as offering prayers. Here, here they are being offered before the Lamb, which is Jesus. And in chapter 8, they are offered before the throne of God. Uh, so, so prayers are going up before Jesus and they are going up before God. That's what we see in the book of Revelation. So you can't deny that prayer is a significant element in the whole plan of salvation because Revelation is focusing on the plan of salvation and the final events in that plan of salvation. And here we see the prayers of the saints are being offered before Christ and before God. We, we would have to conclude that prayer is important. Let's look at a few other places. For example, 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. Here's what it says. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. What I'm, what I'm pointing out here is that according to Peter, according to the apostle Peter, it is possible for your prayers to be hindered. What does the word hinder mean? It means that there's an obstruction. There's something that comes in the way of your prayer being answered. I'm emphasizing this because the point I'm making is that it is very, it, it, it seems to be clear, and I'm going to give some other verses. It seems to be clear that prayer is supposed to be effective. When you pray, it's supposed to bring a result, but it is possible for that result to be hampered. In other words, it's possible for you to not get the, 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 what you are praying for, even though you are praying to God, even though you are praying to Jesus, you're praying to God in the name of Jesus. It's possible that you don't receive what you're asking for because your prayer is hindered. So whether here in this case, it says that um, in this particular case, if the husband is not treating his wife properly, if he's not honoring his wife, in this particular case, Peter is suggesting that your prayers might be hindered. And I find that very interesting because I think most of the time, we don't think of the way we live with our wives or with our husbands or in our family re relationships. We don't think of these things as being, as being factors when we pray. But what Peter is suggesting is that even if we have um, family relationships, husband and wife, that are not um, as God would have them, it can hinder our prayers. So to, to, I'm making that point, but I'm also making the point that I don't want us to miss. It is clear then, it is clear that when we pray, the prayer is supposed to have an effect. There's an important reason why I'm making this point. But I'll come back to my reason in a little bit. I'll get to my reason in a little bit. Um, Philippians 1 and verse 19. Look at what Paul says. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure when Paul says salvation here, He's not talking about his eternal salvation because Paul already had salvation. But if you read, if you read his, his epistle, what, what, what happened to him was that I think at this point he was in prison. His life was in, in jeopardy. His, his freedom was curtailed. And when he says, this shall turn to my salvation, he's talking about being saved from prison. In several of his letters, he's in prison. And so, so when you see the word salvation, Sometimes you have to understand it in the, in the same context as how God would save the Jews from their enemies. And it was they, they referred to it as salvation. So, like, like I think David said, salvation cometh neither from the east nor from the west, but from the Lord. When he says salvation there, he doesn't mean eternal salvation, which is what we sometimes think, but he means salvation from enemies. And here I believe Paul is using the word in that way. He means, if you pray for me through your prayer, I know 
this will turn to my salvation. I think he means deliver, deliverance from prison. So by your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. So, and, and, and you know, it means, it, 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 it means even more because Paul is praying for the wisdom and the strength to preach the gospel. So the word salvation here means God's preservation of his life and God enabling him to carry out his mission. So again, the point I'm making is that it is clear in the teaching and the belief of Paul that prayer makes a difference. I know we hear the phrase, prayer changes things. But does it really? Does, it, does prayer really change things? And I know all of us can testify that we have had prayer answered in our lives, but in our experience. But the thing is, why is it that so many times it seems like our prayers are not answered? And does our, does our prayer really make a difference? I'm going to, I'm going to come to that question and, and show you why I asked this question in a little bit. Um, just two more verses on this, on this, on this, on this focus. Epaphras, who, which is one, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I don't know if, 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 if this is not effective, Epaphras, Epaphras is wasting his time because Paul says this man is working hard and zealously. He uses the word laboring which is a word that indicates hard work. Epaphras is working hard and he's working fervently. The word fervently means with heat, with zeal, with fire. So he's praying with fire and with heat and with zeal and he's praying hard. And what is he wanting? What is he asking God for? That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I know that probably if you are like me, most of you are wanting to have this kind of spirit to pray fervently to labor fervently in prayer and yet if we if we tell the truth most of us will say it's hard to pray like this because i'm not certain that if i put in the work i'm going to see the result um there's a song there's a song that i don't know how many of us know it probably those of us who whoever uh who are from a, a few decades ago we might remember a group named boney m but boney m sang a, a religious song and it says i'm born again i feel free no longer alone a bright light is shining to show me uh, the way that i that i own i can see my way through i know he will walk beside me all those prayers of mine weren't in vain all those prayers of mine weren't in vain I'm born again. I still sing that song, but I, I like it. But that verse, that phrase always sticks in my mind. All those prayers of mine weren't in vain. I'm born again. In, in this song, the songwriter is kind of giving some credit to his prayer for the fact that he's born again. He has been seeking God. I have been challenged. When I was a young Christian, I, I think I, I mentioned it several times but one of the things i used to do was i used to go away, away out in the bush by myself and spend the night i remember the first time i did it i i didn't have a sleeping bag i made a uh i made a kind of you know a body bag out of old crocus bags if you know those here they, 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 what they call crocus bags in jamaica it used to be made out of something like 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 some kind of fibrous cloth and it was it was very rough and but I, I i sewed one together out of a couple of crocus bags and i went down to a place a couple of miles away from my home through the bush in the dark and i went down to a place they call bottom ground i spent the night fighting mosquitoes and trying hard to stay awake i intended to spend the whole night in prayer and meditation but the mosquitoes made it very hard but i i i, I endured till morning and then several times i did that and when I think back on those early days, the effort I put in, because all I wanted, I wanted to be, I wanted to be like one of those old-time Bible prophets. So I put in a lot of 
work in trying to get to know God and trying to find God and trying to get into that deeper relationship. And sometimes I look back today and I look at all the work I put in and I ask myself, was it worth it? Did, did I get something in proportion to what I was looking for? And when I look back at, and I, when I see myself today, when I see myself delivered from my sinful life, yes, but when I see myself and I understand that God has taught me so much and given me a ministry and enabled me to be help to other people, I have to say all those prayers of mine weren't in vain. I have to say I, I, I might not have seen it immediately. Maybe right on the moment I wanted to see a light from heaven and I wanted to feel that blaze of glory and I never saw that. I mean, sometimes in prayer, I was highly, I was highly lifted up, filled with love and zeal. But I mean, like I never had a vision. I never saw a light from heaven. But I look back over the years and I say, all those prayers of mine weren't in vain. I think I've been blessed in proportion to how much I was seeking the Lord. Like the Lord says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. But it ties into the question we're asking this morning. Does prayer really make a difference? Is it worth it to put in that effort? And I know we're not going to do this unless we believe it works. If it doesn't make sense, why would I pray? If I'm going to spend all my time laboring fervently in prayer, I'm going to be praying for, for, for Sister Maria, for, for Sister Diane. I'm praying for you. You ask me to pray. And I spend days praying and nothing happens. Why would I do this? I read of a man, a man named G.C. Bevington. He was Pentecostal. If you ever, if you ever get a hold of this little book, it's called um, Modern Miracles. I actually have it in PDF format, but it's, 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 it's this person, G.C. Bevington, telling his, his life story. Strange little book, but it's true. And among other things, you know, one time this man said that God told him to go and preach in a certain area. And when he went there, they would not allow him to use a schoolroom. And he, he went and he sat down under a tree for nine days. I think it was nine days without eating food. In, in, in the rain and in the sun, nine days under a tree, waiting for the Lord to tell him how to get into that schoolroom so he could keep the meetings. Another time, and on the ninth day, he got an answer. Nine days? Another time he was on some other mission and he, he crawled into a hollow log out in the woods and he spent five days out there in that hollow log. And I think of this man and I think, he is crazy. He has lost his mind. But when I read his story and I, I see the answers he had to prayer, it challenges me. But then I ask myself, would I go and spend nine days sitting under a tree? If, if I don't think that God is going to respond, would I go and spend nine days fasting, sitting under a tree, if I don't think that God is going to respond? Look here. If I could guarantee that God would answer me, brothers and sisters, I would fast for 40 days. If it would become a guarantee, I think most of you will agree with me. You know the people we are praying for, right? You know we are praying for for um, the different people, Sister Gloria, Brother Emerd, Brother Donald in Canada, and other people who have asked for prayer over time. But, but what is our prayer life like? I know it is in proportion to our expectation. We want to pray and we are praying, but there is not that certainty. So the question I'm asking this morning is a very real question. Does prayer really change things? Is prayer really necessary? In James 5 and verse 16, it says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Confident words. So we ask ourselves why. You know, in my own case, in my own case, my mother, I've told you, my mother always uh, took some kind of credit for my becoming a Christian. Mama said that she prayed for me for five years. That's a long time to pray for somebody. She said she prayed for me for five years until I gave my life to God because 
in her in her statement i was the, i was the worst one of the children and i was but um i don't know but i'm i'm kind of i'm kind of beginning to accept what my mother said because when i became a christian i had no intention no inclination no leaning towards christianity you, you know a lot of people they are they are kind of thinking in this way and they are drifting in this direction and they have been they've had godly thoughts i had nothing like this i was the op i was going the opposite direction when 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 i encountered this problem that made me turn to god so i want to give some cred credence to my um what my mother says now here is the thing here is the key issue that i want us to consider this morning there are two things about god that we have facing us two things about god and i'd like us to consider these two things two things that seem to contradict each other but i want us to consider them number one is the sovereignty of god what do i mean when i talk about the sovereignty of god i mean that god is god god is almighty nobody can stand against god nothing can resist god this is one perspective many christians they want to preserve the sovereignty of god they want to preserve the idea of god as god almighty the god that nobody can stand before nobody can resist as it says in in the book of daniel i think in chapter four the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whoever he will you particularly see this picture of god in the old testament where the old testament in the old testament god is a god above all gods no god can stand before him he knows the end from the beginning and he's like everything is just working according to his will because nothing can stand before him that is one that's point number one that we want to preserve the sovereignty of god but the second thing that we want to preserve here's the second thing we want to preserve the idea that God is a God who is fair and just and good. God is sovereign, number one, but number two, God is fair and God is just and God is good. Now, two doctrines have arisen out of these two perspectives, two, two major doctrines. I want to label them. Well, not to label them, I want to explain what um i want to explain both of them one of them is what what people refer to as the doctrine of predestination and the other one i i don't remember the exact label but it's it's, it's the doctrine of free will or free choice now these are major ideologies in christianity i think i think john calvin was the the person who who popularized the doctrine of predestination so both of these things are fundamentally incom incompatible now i'm going to give my own understanding of each thing and i'll show you why they are incompatible the doctrine of predestination believes that god it, it preserves it seeks to preserve god's sovereignty it builds on the idea that god is almighty and he can do anything that he wants not only that he can do but he does do everything that he wants and the whole universe and the whole controversy and everything is just following god's carefully designed plan and nothing can stand against it nothing can resist it this is basically the doctrine where where we we go with the idea of predestination and that's a basic idea all right you can get into into subheadings and explore more fully but we should remember that the doctrine of predestination is really trying to preserve the idea of God's sovereignty, God's greatness, and that God is above all. And you can find the verses. You can find the verses in the Bible to support this idea. Some of them in the writings of Paul, many of them in the Old Testament, you can find these verses. However, here is the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that in order to accept the doctrine of predestination in its absolute sense, you have to you have to you have to conclude that nobody is free. Nobody is free. Every single person in the universe is simply 
to use my words, is a puppet in God's plan. I believe that you can't just look at a doctrine. You have to look behind the doctrine and understand the, the implications of the doctrine and the consequences of the doctrine. If you, if you, if you just take, take a doctrine based on certain verses in the Bible, you will believe in everlasting burning hell. And some people believe this. Some Christians believe this. And why do they believe it? They say God is sovereign. They say God is almighty. God can do what, is, what God wants to do. And who are you to say that this is unfair? That's one, one, one strong argument of, of those who believe in the sovereignty of God in an absolute sense. They say God knows what is best and you are just a creature. You can't argue with God. If God says he's going to roast people forever, then he will roast people forever. And your place is to shut your mouth, zip your lips and say nothing. However, you will understand that this causes many problems. First of all, God wants people to love him. God wants people to trust him. God wants people to admire him. God wants the universe to be a happy place. And everybody knows that one of the greatest causes of unhappiness is the idea that you are being manipulated. It's the idea that you are just a, a, a cog in the machinery. And you are put in your place and you have no option and no choice. You are just a, you are just a tool being used. The, the idea of absolute predestination leaves, leaves us in this place. For example, my mother says that she prayed for me and that contributed to my salvation. But on the, on the basis of the doctrine of predestination, my mother's prayer was completely useless. It made no difference. It did not affect me. It did not affect God's work in my life. It might have affected my mother's thinking, but nothing else. That's what the doctrine of predestination says. The doctrine of predestination makes me conclude that when, when somebody says, pray for me, I don't need to pray for you. My prayer will not change anything because God is sovereign. And because God is sovereign, he, is, he has a plan that he's following in this universe. And this plan involves Hitler. It involves Satan. It involves the death of billions. And it doesn't matter. This is God's plan. Billions have to be lost in this plan. It's not just a plan. It's a design. Remember, you can have a plan that allows for certain things to happen. But in the doctrine of, in, in this idea of God's sovereignty, it's not just that God allows things to happen. It's that God designs things to happen. So the person who is designed to be lost cannot be saved under any circumstances because it, his salvation depends on the determination of God. God made, it, made up his mind about that. You didn't make up your mind. You have no choice in it. For me, and for most of us, this appears to be unfair, unreasonable, and unloving. Now, one answer to this is that somebody might say, who are you to judge God? Who are you to say this is unfair? Who are you to say this is unreasonable or unloving? You're just a man and you don't know anything about fairness or reasonableness or love. All right, fair enough, fair enough. I'm a human being and I probably have perverted ideas. So then, this is the question I would ask. If this is true and my concept of love is so contrary to God's concept of love, then how am I supposed to love God? How am I supposed to love God or to love my neighbors when I don't even know what love is? If my concept of love and justice is so perverted and so unfair, where can I see the concept that I can admire and that I can copy? All right, I'm supposed to look at God's concept. And when I look at God's concept of fairness, what I see is something that says, in my understanding, that is unfair. I see something that if I treat people like this, I will be considered wicked. I'll be considered unfair, cruel. What if from the day one of my children was born, I treated him badly? 
and I treated the other one well. I sent one to school. I made the other one go and work hard at trying to earn money. I didn't feed one and I fed the other one. What would you think of me? But if I am to accept the idea that God's justice works in this way, then this is the kind of justice I should also practice. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell on this over much, but I'm just trying to, to help us to understand why even without going to the, the scripture and looking at the thing from a, 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 a practical perspective, it, it appears to be unfair to think of God as arbitrarily assigning salvation and damnation to people. My brother is lost and I am saved. I said, thank you, God, for saving me. And in the back of my mind, something is saying, shall I thank you? because you made my brother to be lost, good for me. But what about my poor brother? He didn't have a chance. How do I respond to this? What, what, what I am supposed to do is shut my mind to justice and to what is reasonable and fair. I'm to shut my mind and to carry on what is for me just a pretense because I'm saying you're fair and you're just and you're good, but my mind and my heart does not agree. So this is one of the reasons why the other side of the coin exists, the, the, the coin that says God has given free will. So people like me try to balance the idea of God being almighty and sovereign with the idea that God also have, has given absolute free will to every human being. So we try to balance these two things. So is God Almighty? Yes. Is God able to do anything that he wants? Yes. But then the question comes, does God do everything that he wants? And from me, the answer would come, no, he doesn't. So the question would be, why doesn't God do everything that he wants? And the answer is, because God has made a universe of free beings. And if you're free, God has to put this into the formula. If you are really free, God has to allow you to be free. Either you're free or you're a slave. Either you're free or you're a robot. Once you're free, God has to put this into the formula. Because when you make somebody free, you cannot guarantee how, per, how a person will use that freedom. So this is the argument. This is the di dilemma. And it, it is related to the question of, does prayer really work? Does prayer make any sense? And I'm telling you, it's very important because it depends, it, it, it affects, it affects how we view this thing. If I believe that God is the one who has made all these determinations and we are simply actors in a play, we are just each of us following the script because the script is already written. God has written the script and God manipulates the strings and we are just following the script. Honestly, for me, what, what I would do, I would stop, I would probably stop any effort at living a Christian life because I, I would conclude it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any sense. It does not matter. What matters is what God chooses. I used to argue like this when I was, when I was still a young fellow thinking that I was an atheist. My father would talk to me and to get my father off my back, I would say, Daddy, does God know if I'm going to be saved? My father said, yes, of course, God knows everything. I said, well, if God knows I'm going to be saved, I can't be lost. And if God knows I'm going to be lost, I can't be saved. And, and I thought I had my daddy in a place where he couldn't get away. And, and he would say, David, David, you are deliberately misrepresenting it. And I just went away feeling sm smug and satisfied. Later on, I found out how stupid I was because what I was doing, I was trying to, I was, I was confusing God's foreknowledge. I was confusing foreknowledge with predestination. I was trying to say to my father, God has predestined whether I'm lost or saved, so it cannot change. My father was trying to help me to understand God knows the future. It doesn't mean that God 
ordain you to be lost or to be saved. That future depends upon your free will. I learned this afterwards, but I didn't know it at that time. And so I was comfortable in my wicked ways. So the question arises then, based on my perspective, the question arises based on my understanding. And I'm saying my understanding because whenever you come upon two different ideas, I don't want to be arrogant. I don't want to be, I don't want to stand on the, on the soapbox and say, I'm absolutely right and everybody else is wrong. I don't want to say this. But I hope that when I, when I, when I say my understanding, I can present reasons that are strong enough that reasonable people can look and see if it makes sense. Because that's all we do when, when, when we choose our beliefs. We, we see if what we are hearing or what we are reading or what, what we are understanding makes sense. Then we add it to our system of beliefs. If it doesn't make sense, we reject it. That's the way we develop as Christians. If it makes sense, good, we take this. If it doesn't, we leave it. So I'm saying, based on, on my understanding, why is it that some people become Christians and some people don't become Christians? Because when you look at, at, at the world and you look at life, it seems like so many people have the same opportunities, some even better than others. And this is a question that bothered me for a long time. What made me become a Christian? And others in my family have not yet become Christians and they have lived much longer than me and they have had the same kind of advantages that I had. What makes some become Christians and some die unbelievers? What is the reason? That is one of the questions that bothered me. And... um. I think it is maybe one of the reasons too that contributes to the idea that God is the one who chooses who will be saved and who will be lost. It contributes to that idea. But <clears throat> I began to realize, I began to realize that one of the things that we need to understand is that everybody has different circumstances. If all of us in this room, there are 90 of us in this room at this moment, if all of us were put in prison and we were, we, were, we were given the choice to give up our Christianity or to die or to be starved to death. How many of us would give up the first day? Maybe nobody. By about day number 10, a few might be secretly giving up, especially if nobody else knows about it, right? If they put us in separate rooms, maybe about day 10. By about day 15, more might give up. And some of us will hold on until we die. What makes different people respond differently at different times? Is it because you are free to choose? You have free will? Is it because all of us have different circumstances? Some of us are physically stronger. Some of us are mentally stronger. Some of us have had experiences in the past that have built our faith stronger than others. Not everybody will respond in the same way. Our, our circumstances and our past and our background has an effect on how we respond in different situations. When I began to, to, to see this more clearly, I began to understand how and why I became a Christian. You know, God found exactly the right circumstances that made me turn to God. It was exactly the right circumstances. You know, I've shared my story with some people. I think I even shared it with my children not so long ago because I don't like to tell people what was the trouble that I found myself in. You have to be a very good friend and I tell you, but I don't want to tell people. Because I don't want people to know the kind of person I was at that time. But I don't share, I don't share what it was, the kind of trouble I got myself into. I don't share it with people normally. But I shared it with my um, children recently. And my grown children, you know what they said? Hmm, that's not anything too serious. <laughs> that's not anything too serious. That's what they said. If that had happened to them, it would not have made them Christians. That's what they are actually saying. If that had happened to them, it would not have made them seek God. Yet for me, based on my circumstances and my upbringing, it was the end of the world. 
it brought me to the place where I was thinking of taking my own life. I have a brother I keep talking about. He has been in worse places. He has been in jail. He has spent a few, in jail a few times. He has not given his life to God. If, 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 if half of what happened to him had happened to me, I'd have been a Christian long before. But the thing is, your circumstances and your upbringing have something to do with the things that impact on your mind and on your spirit and on your life. Who knows how to reach people? You don't and I don't. There is Sister Lai sitting there. I don't know what Sister Lai's past is, what her history is, how her mind works, but there's one person who knows. And what we, what we see is that when somebody starts to pray for another person, what happens is that heaven begins to respond. Heaven responds when you pray for somebody. And what happens is that God begins to work in this person's life to reach those areas that you don't know and you don't understand and you cannot reach. That's the, that's the principle behind prayer. Let me show you one case in the Bible. Look at this statement here. Uh, where is it? It's in, um, it's in the book of Acts. I think it's chapter 7. Maybe, maybe chapter 10. Yes. In, cha in Acts chapter 10, we have the story of the Roman centurion Cornelius. An angel came to Cornelius. Let's read the story. It says he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, an angel from heaven comes down to Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And the angel says, and he said unto him, thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. That's a very interesting statement. I, 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 I did a sermon focused on this verse some time ago, but it's very interesting each time you look at it and consider it, because what it is saying is that this man Cornelius, who was not even a Jew, not even considered one of God's people, but what he had been doing, he had been praying and he had been trying to live a virtuous life, being kind to people. And the angel came down from heaven and says, your prayers, they have come up before God. Remember, we started out by seeing that in the book of Revelation, the, 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 they are offering sin incense before God, which is the prayers of the saints. At some point, Cornelius's prayers came up before God. And as a result of those prayers, an angel was sent to Cornelius. How come this angel was not sent to Herod or Julius Caesar or, 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 or to all the other Roman centurions? Why was it that the, the, this Roman centurion had an angel visit, visit him? And the angel said that in heaven, your prayers have come up for review before God. This for me is one of those statements that says, your prayers are not in vain. Sometimes it takes a while, but prayer changes things. Prayer moves the hand of God, if I, if I may put it that way. The sovereign almighty God is influenced by our prayers. So I want to ask the question, how is this possible? How is this possible? I'm going to try to bring it together by making a suggestion. Since God is almighty, we all agree with that. Everybody agrees. Since God is sovereign, everybody agrees. Sovereign means that he's king and he has the ability to do anything that he wants to do. Now, God can do anything that he wants to do. There's no question. God is almighty. But here's the other question. Will God do anything that he can do? Will God do anything that he can do? I learned from my father some very important lessons, my earthly father. My father had many faults, but one thing he was, he was a, a good father. And he, 
he, he gave me some things that have stuck with me. I remember the time when I, I, I stole three pence from my brother. I was about 11 or so. I stole three pence from my brother. And um, my, my father, my, my brother bothered me about it and I kept saying I didn't take his money. Eventually he went to daddy. And um, after a while, my father, my, I asked, my, my father asked me about it. I said, no, I didn't take it. But you know, my father was sure that I took it. My brother was sure that I took it because they knew, they knew me. So my father called the whole family together. My mother, my brother, my other brother, my other brother, my other brother, my sister, the baby. He called everybody into the room and he sat, sat, sat down everybody. And he, I was there and, and then he said, David, did you take all his money? I said, no, daddy. He gave me a little talk about honesty. And then he, he said again, David, did you take all his money? No, daddy. Then he said, he talked a little bit more. He was a long talker, I tell you. When he would talk, you would pray and say, please beat me and stop talking. So then he said, can I believe you? I said, yes, daddy. And it, he, he, the next question, it teaches me how my parents raised me because when, when daddy said, can Jesus believe you? I could not answer. I know many of these beer faced, dry eyed young people today would not have batted an eyelid. But the way I was raised in my family, I, I was raised with a fear of God, which again, it goes to circumstances. So when he said, can Jesus believe you? I could not answer. Then my father gave me another long talk and very regretfully he sent me to get the belt and he gave me four little taps in my, in my hand, just little touches. But by the time I got the first one, I was bawling. I was so relieved, I was bawling. Now, the point I'm making is, did my father have to do that? It wasn't necessary from the beginning. He knew who took the money. He knew from the beginning, from the beginning, he, he never needed to call my mother, my brothers, the whole family. He never needed this process of interrogation from the moment he asked me the first time and he looked at my eyes, he knew who took the money. Why did he go through calling my mother, my whole family? Why did he put me in the middle and interrogate me? Why did he even go through the process of beating me when he knew he wasn't really hurting me? He didn't, he didn't attempt to hurt me. Why did he go through all of this? And I'm saying I learned from my father and I, I, I respected him for it till the day he died. And I still respect him because I know many parents. Once the brother reported, what they would have done is ask him, you took the money, you know you took it. And they would have gotten a belt and wheeled him across his bottom, wheeled me across my bottom, across my back. I see so many parents, that's what they do. My father had control of the situation. He could do what he wanted. He was a father, but you know what he did? He operated in such a way that he showed his justice, he showed his fairness. If he had not proven it that day, I would not have been spanked. They would have known I was a thief, but I would, I would not have been spanked. He proved everything clearly in such a way that I was helped, my whole family was helped, and everybody knew the justice of my father, that what he did was just. He was the authority in that house. But the thing that made him operate in this way was his justice, his fairness. He didn't, wa he didn't want to just punish me for what I did. He wanted everybody to benefit. He wanted his son to know that he was fair and he was just. Now, like I say, I learned a lot from my father and it helped me to understand why God can do anything he wants. But God does not do anything he wants. Because in the same way, the Bible teaches that God also operates on the basis of, let me say, public opinion. Public opinion. Let me show you a verse in the Bible that actually, look at Romans 3 and verse 4. It says, God forbid, yea. Let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. When 
who is judged? Let me show you where this verse comes from. It actually comes from Psalm. Now, why isn't this coming up? I'm not getting the reference here. Um, Psalm 51 and verse 4. Now, it, it, I, I'm just going to show you something interesting. It's not, it's not related to, um, it's not related to what we are studying. But look at what it says here. David is in Psalm 51. It's after he took um, Uriah's wife. He says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Now, in, 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 the, in, the, in the King James Version, in the Psalms, it says that God might be clear when he judges. It says it in a lot of versions, but I want to show you in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament scriptures. It says, against thee, against thee only have I sinned and done evil before thee, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged this is the version paul was quoting from most of us may not know but most bible students believe that the, the bible that jesus and the apostles used was the septuagint which is a greek version of the scriptures and the reason why they believe this is because of verses like this over and over you come upon verses in the new testament where they are quoting from the old testament when you go to the King James Version or to any other English versions, it reads differently. You go to the Septuagint, the Greek version, and you find the same exact statement as what they quoted. So this is why we are, we are pretty sure that they were using the Septuagint. But the point is, Paul is quoting here, and he's quoting from, and it says that you, God, might overcome when you, God, are being judged. And that's the point Paul is making. Paul is making the point that God is being judged. And when God is judged, it is necessary for God to overcome. Or in other words, it's necessary for God to be justified. When you look at God and the way he does things, it's necessary that you come to the conclusion that God is fair and God is reasonable in what he's doing. It's necessary. This is the only reason, brothers and sisters, it's the only reason why you can why you can understand what has been happening with the whole story of sin. It's the only way you can reasonably understand it. Let me show you a few things. God is in heaven and Satan appears before God and God says, what are you doing here? Where are you coming from? Satan says, I have been walking up and down in the earth and looking it over. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, Job only serves you because you are kind to Job. Now, what Satan is really saying is that Job has the freedom to serve you or not to serve you. But because you bless Job, he has been blessing you. If you turn around and stop blessing him, he will curse you to, to your face. Satan believes in free will. Satan believes in free will and he's challenging God that if God treats Job negatively, Job will use his free will to curse God. God says to Satan, all right, I'm going to allow you to prove it. So God allows Satan to go and exercise Job's free will. If Job had no free will, this argument is a waste of time. It doesn't make sense because Job cannot do anything but what God tells him to do. So, so there's no free will. So the whole challenge that Satan throws to God, you understand, it would be just a an exercise in foolishness. It makes sense if you understand and the freedom of Job to choose. If you look at Daniel 4 and verse 17, this is the place where a decree was made that Nebuchadnezzar was to be mad and to eat grass for seven years like a cow, like a wild beast. And look at what it says here, an interesting statement. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand 
by the word of the Holy Ones. To the intent or for the purpose that the living may know that the Most High rule it in the kingdom of men and give it it to whomsoever he will. Who made the decision? It says it is by the decree of the watchers. Who are these watchers? It is by the demand of the Holy Ones. In other words, what this is saying to me is that God is not the one who makes this decision by himself. There are other beings involved in making decisions in heaven. God is almighty. God is sovereign, but God is not a dictator. There are others involved in what God is doing in heaven. So based on this, and, and there, there are many verses that talk about this. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. What's the point of being judged? And God says, you are guilty. God, I'm guilty. I could not do better. I was chosen to be guilty. I was designed to be guilty. I was born to be lost. What is this sham of bringing me for the judgment seat? What is this idea of demonstrating my guilt when I had no choice? For me and my sense of fair play, this would be most unreasonable. And of course, I am not God. Who am I to say it is unfair? I am only the person that God asks to trust his fairness and to trust his justice and to trust his love. I'm only that person. How can I trust what everything is saying to me is unfair? How can I be happy about what my, my whole education, including my biblical education, is telling me is unjust? How can I? Don't ask me to decide if this is fair. If my teaching tells me it is unfair. Anyway. I'm hoping that you're you're understanding what I'm trying to say. So, Brother David. Yes, Brother Arthur. My time is up, and I want to make the last few points. So make it very quick, please. Yeah, um, it is a very important subject that you're um dealing with, and it might be astounding to know that a lot of Christians still believe this nonsense. It paints this um picture of I call it the left predestination. It paints the most high black. And if it is not understood, it, it creates a whole lot of issues in one's conscience. And it is a very, very important subject matter. And I really endorse everything you're saying. All right, thank you, Brother Arda. Now, the last point I'm going to make, and um, I don't know, maybe, maybe sometime we can open this up for discussion, but my time is, is gone already. I'm over the time. So I'm going to make the last point. I, 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 I think that for most of my life, I have had the idea that not everybody can be saved. I mean, I never believed in predestination, but I realized that in my thinking and how I operate, I've been kind of operating that way. I, I believe not everybody can be saved. I pray for people a few times and then I'm ready to stop. But as I'm, as I'm thinking about this and looking at it, another thought comes to my mind. And the thought is everybody if, if, if we have true free will, everybody potentially can be saved. Why then do some make the wrong decision so many times? It is because not everybody can be approached in the same way. Maybe I've been expecting everybody to have the same kind of experience like I had. But I find that some become Christians by a process of gradual change over time until one day they make that move. Some become Christians by careful study of the Bible over time. Some, Jesus knocks them down on the road to Damascus. Some, like me, they get into terrible trouble. Some have a vision. But what I think makes a difference in almost every case, somebody has made it their duty to pray for these people. Somebody prayed for these people or somebody worked with these people or some way, some influence from God was able to reach them at that critical spot. Now, if my brother has not turned to Christ after 40 years, maybe God has used 500 different ways to reach him. But you know what? God has 500 more angles to try. God has 500 more angles because what I realize is you just have to reach the right place. In my case, thank God, 
my mother prayed and God, God was able to reach me at 22 years old. Some people, God, God comes this way, they don't break. He comes this way, they don't break. He comes this way, they don't break. But you keep praying. You keep praying because you believe in the power of prayer. You believe that prayers come before God with the incense of Jesus' righteousness and prayer moves heaven. And so heaven approaches him another way and heaven comes another way and heaven comes another way. And one day, you keep praying. One day, the breakthrough comes because prayer Amen. Billions of people will be lost. You know why? Nobody prayed for them. I mean, we might pray generally, Lord, bless the world. Yes, but that is not going to, that is where I believe everybody has already been blessed. But that particular effort of heaven, like the angel comes down to Cornelius and says, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. That particular effort where heaven moves mightily in a person's life. Brothers and sisters, it requires that persistent prayer where we do not let go. And why don't we let go? Because we believe prayer makes a difference. And why do we let go and we stop praying? Because we believe it doesn't make sense. Prayer changes nothing. And this is why I wanted to talk about the, this, this, this morning, because I believe the way we pray tells the truth about whether we believe prayer is effective or not. The Apostle Paul believed in it to the point where he says, pray without ceasing. Jesus believed in it to the point where he says, I will pray the Father to the point where he says, he tells the story of this woman who went before the judge and she would not give up even though the judge was hard and would not respond. She did not give up. The point he was making is the need for us to be persistent and to continue to trust in the way we pray, even when it seems like nothing is happening. So I apologize for going so much over time this morning, to be honest, I, I, on the topic. I could probably have gone on for a lot longer, but um, I want to thank and appreciate all of you for your participation and for your attentiveness. And I hope that there has been something useful that we have been able to gain from this presentation.